You're listening to WCOM LP 103.5 FM Carborough and Chapel Hill. It's a Tuesday, it's five o'clock, and that only means one thing. It's time for another round of Snarky Faith with your host, Stuart Deloney. This is a space where we irreverently wrestle through life, culture, and spirituality, all with our heads in the clouds, our tongues in our cheeks, our hearts in our sleeves, and our feet on the ground. At Snarky Face, the questions or even the answers are never the point. It's all about the conversation. So here's your host, Stuart Deloney. Well, good afternoon and welcome to another round of Snarky Faith Radio. I'm your host, Stuart Deloney. So welcome here again this week. This, this, this week that we find ourselves in. Oh, God, has it been a hell of a week? Uh, Yeah, it has. Um, Three mass shootings. In America, two, like, over the weekend, El Paso and Dayton. And, frankly, I'm just tired of of having this to kick off the beginning of, of our shows here. This is, I feel like it's been too much of a trend lately that we have to begin by by addressing the tragedies that, that are happening. And, and it's not going to get any better not going to get any better and unless we look at this from a different way unless we begin to stop keeping score stop taking sides and just like like this these situations are i know they're political in nature but i feel like we always respond in a political nature like inherently these shootings are a very human thing and and I think that we need to learn how to respond as humans first. And then we can let the politics in on this as, as, as we move forward. Because I think far too often do we continue to see everyone making the same excuses, uh, the same outrage from certain sides, excuses from the other side. And this just continues again. You know, who's to say that this isn't going to happen again next week the following week the next month because we're not doing anything and we're just sending out thoughts and prayers and somehow hoping this problem is just not going to happen in our own community i mean i know where where we're at here in north carolina school is going to be starting back in a couple of weeks and i again you know these kind of things it's it's heart-wrenching it's it's just awful and at the same time it's terrifying It's terrifying if you have loved ones out there. It's terrifying if you're just a human now. I mean, it feels like there's an open season in America on humans. And and so we're going to devote some of the time this hour to talking about uh, part of the problem. Um, Because I'm going to go ahead and outline just ahead of time. This is a very very complex issue when we begin to talk about um, what all is feeding into this. We've got issues of like of, of like white nationalism. We've got issues of hate. We've got issues of gun control. We've got issues of Christian nationalism. (laughs) Uh, We have a lot of issues in America feeding into this. And, and this is what, what kind of um, blows my mind. And, and again, we'll dive more into this uh, in in kind of the bulk of our show here. But what, what hit me was about how the world media is now responding to us. Because you know, in the U.S., we get we get caught up in like fake news and all this other BS that happens. To where I have my news channels I listen to, I have those that I ridicule, and you know, never the two shall meet. And so we kind of just we we read the news through our own, you know, red or, or blue colored glasses, and and it's different when we begin to see this from from an outside perspective. I work with um, I work with a lot of Chinese students. Um, from adults down to kids, and and I get lots of questions all the time um, about what's going on in America. What's wrong with this? Um, why does every American own a gun? You know, <laughs> questions like that, which I'll say, well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. That's not true. Um, but the headlines around the world, from places outside of our sandbox here, um, are definitively saying this. The U.S., um, is in the midst of a white nationalism or white nationalist terrorism crisis. So that we are living right now in a white nationalism terrorist crisis. That is a weird, weird, weird place to be when we're sitting here in, 
in 2019. It, it is an odd place to be. And, and, and I don't want to spend this hour just pointing fingers. Um, I want this hour to kind of be a bit of a... I'm going to speak on this in many, like, uh, in many more micro terms. I feel like oftentimes when people approach this, when they look at it from a far off perspective of looking at the U.S. and what are the problems and how do we fix this kind of stuff, and we take like a real macro approach to it. You know, we have this this large approach to to the whole landscape of it. But I also know that that change happens on the micro. It happens on the the small level. It happens on how I interact with those around me. And so, some of the focus of what I'm going to be running through is going to be talking about kind of us, like us and how to, how do we respond and and what are the postures that that can lead towards changing this and and healing in our communities because I, I feel like far too often and and we've seen this again and again we we make this into a political issue and we assume that the people that we have elected to represent us will represent us as a people in America and time and time again we realize that this is just a farce that, that politics doesn't really work for us. It really just works for those who are in charge or those who have money. And it may be easy to sit and rail against um, the brokenness of our system, as I do oftentimes on this show. But today I want to make this about like us, about you, about me, and, and about what we can do on a you and me level. Um, because I, I, I just, I continue to see this trend and, and I, and again, it's an aspect, it's an aspect. I'm not trying to say this is a silver bullet. This is a way to fix it. But, but I, I do know like when we have these issues that happen time and time again, I'll have like people, um, send me emails and stuff and be like, my heart's broken. What do we do about this? How do we fix this? Who do we call? What do we do? And, and I think that it, it's important for us to not grow desensitized towards the loss of human life. I think it's important that we that we don't become calloused towards acts of hate and violence. Um, and, and I think that we need to be able to to see these for what they are, and and say that this is not okay, and that this is not the new normal. I and mean, I'm 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 not going to accept that this is a new way of life. So you got me. You got me? Sorry, sorry. We kind of, I like to start off the show with a lot of energy, but this is not, <laughs> this is going to be a little bit more of an introspective day here because, again, I feel like many of us are feeling this. It is just, it's, it's just another heartbreak. And how much can our hearts break and we continue to just do business as usual moving forward? I, I, just, I just think that, that we need to be able to absorb this pain, that we need to be able to absorb this chaos. We need to be able to absorb all of this this insanity that's happening and and let it let it hurt let us grieve let us mourn let us do that and so again yes sorry um we will be talking a bit about the introspective nature of of dealing with situations like this but 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 um one of the things that that i I was I was doing here. So still to rope this into our, what we normally do here on the show. Um, I I was sitting and I was I was just reading and 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 listening to the responses and it's and they're always they're always just they're always just ridiculous. There's there's anything from lies to mainly excuses towards blame in areas now to where I know the president is beginning to say, oh, this is about either mental illness or or, or video game violence. And this isn't about hate and and white nationalism. And this isn't about hate speech and, and, and people being riled up to do things that are just awful. That are just awful. So, beginning on this cheery note, uh, today we're going to devote the Christian crazy to some of the responses um, that, that, have, that have come out that are just mind-numbingly mind-numbingly stupid. But, 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 don't worry. As most things within the Christian crazy, they may be moronic, idiotic, and stupid, but they are always on brand for what these crazy asshats are selling. So, so, 
Without any further ado, let's go ahead and hop into the Christian crazy of the week. This is our excuses after mass shooting edition of this. Hopefully we'll never do this one again. Claude Hammers, the Lord is my shepherd. He know what I want. So we have first up, Ray Comfort, the man whose name doesn't really fit him whatsoever. There's no comfort in Ray Comfort there. And every time I say his name, I, I for those of you who are into very niche British comedy, any fans of Toast of London here? Because every time I say Ray Comfort's name, I want to say Ray Bloody Comfort. Mm, no? No one? No one? Ray. Ray Bloody Patches. I'll stop my aside there. So Ray Comfort, you may know of him. He's the... Aussie dude that liked to hang out with Kirk Cameron in the Way of the Master video. Yeah, those? Remember those? Way of the Master where they would go around confronting people on the streets with their sin in a TMZ-style kind of camera move. So they would go up and confront someone like with the Ten Commandments showing them how sinful they were. That guy? The guy that likes to hold a banana and say that uh, there's a pop top on it and God made it just for our hands. That was a way to prove that God is real, because bananas, bananas, bananas. But of course, Ray Bloody Comfort is bananas to begin with. And so his bananas take, his bananas take is very way of the master. I'll let you listen to what he has to say about why we're having mass shootings in America. Here we go. We have yet another mass shooting in our country. This time, at least 20 people are dead. And once again, experts are mystified as to why this is happening so often. The answer to this question isn't complicated. As a nation, we've thrown out the Ten Commandments, and that's left a generation without a measuring rod of good and evil. So we've thrown out the Ten Commandments. I, I, when, would, when did we throw out the Ten Commandments? Like... When was it thrown away? Oh, oh, I mean, we can't post it in schools or in courts, in federal courts or state courts around here. We can't do this. Oh, my gosh. It's strictly because of that. It's because of that, that we don't, that we're having these mass shootings right now. Oh, Ray, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We, we need to get to Kinko's right away. Print up some Ten Commandments posters, put them around in our schools, and then magically... Everyone will stop the violence. That's right. That's right, Ray. We didn't start the fire. It was always burning since the Ten Commandments were getting thrown out of... What? I Ray, shut the fuck up, Ray. Shut the fuck up. Yep, it's one of those shows where Stuart has to break out the censor again. Sorry for that. I'm not really sorry for that. May happen again. I'm not going to guarantee that. But oh my God, seriously, seriously, you know, way... Ah, uh, these kind of answers, these kind of answers drive me insane because it's stuff that a lot of Christians will nod their heads to and it's stuff that we can just blame everyone else for. Oh, the Ten Commandments aren't posted around here? Oh, people don't know what bad stuff is? Why didn't I think of that? Yeah, yeah no, 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 no. I, I'm pretty sure people know when stuff's effed up. I'm pretty sure that people know what evil is. I'm pretty sure we know, we know, we know, Ray. It's just you that don't know, who somehow think something so dumb, so mindless, and so, mm, yeah, is going to fix the problem. Because it's not. Because it's not, Ray. It's not. So... Go back to the way of the master and keep your opinions to yourself because really, really, this is exactly what we needed. This was the balm that would heal it all. Oh, Ten Commandments? Oh, man, it was staring us right in our eyes the whole time. What if we even memorized them? Yeah, that'll fix it all, won't it? No, it won't. No, it won't. No, it won't. No. This is just another, like, deflection. This is just another thing that just pleases your own brand and whoever the hell follows you still and Kirk's of the Cameron. So, ah, uh, Ray bloody comfort. Ray bloody purchase. What are you doing here? So I'm sorry. I needed that last one to just kind of cleanse my palate. We will not speak of Ray bloody comfort anymore. None of that. 
Next up we have Chris McDonald, who's a prophet. He's an online prophet. Uh, he's showed up here from time to time. I actually, a lot of the times he does fall on my radar and he's just too weird and creepy and out there to really make it to the Christian crazy. So uh, many times I will not, I will not mention him, deal with him, but you know, it's one of those special times. One of the little special times. When I say Chris McDonald, I'm not talking about the actor that plays Shooter McGavin and Happy Gilmore. So, don't get your hopes up. It's not that Chris McDonald. It's a much lesser one and a much crazier one. Who wants to tell us about why the shootings are happening? Here we go. Chris, what do you think? Senseless acts of violence that um, are just tearing our country to pieces right now. And I'm going to get into that. Uh, I don't want to get into the political realm of that this morning, but I do want to say this about the spiritual part of it. Um, folks, there, there's a spiritual war over this country. And when you see these things that take place like you saw last night in El Paso and Dayton, uh, it's nothing but the devil. All right. Well, well, Chris isn't off to too bad of a start right here. We're, we're at least kind of we're decrying uh, these senseless acts of violence. We're calling it a tragedy. We're saying it's the devil or AKA it's an evil act. Right. Right. So that we're, we're pretty straight and narrow here. Right. I mean, not too far off. Huh? Huh? <laughs> Chris, right. You're, you're not going to turn this into something crazy, are you? Oh, we're in the segment called Christian crazy on the show. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do your thing, buddy. Do your thing. You be you. Uh, the guns didn't do this. People did this full of the devil. And they were demon-possessed, and these people uh, are being used as pawns in this elite, deep state game to control this country, to take the guns away, to take any freedom away that we've got. And listen to me. And there we went. We went from calling it evil to saying it was de uh, <laughs> demon possession to also wanting to make sure, hey, 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 the demons did this. The demons are the ones that did this, not the guns. The guns are innocent. They're innocent like little unborn babies in people's stomachs that are white. They're innocent. So no one go around calling out them guns. The guns are innocent. Oh, but wait, on top of it, not there. We also went to the deep state. And not only is this a deep state. Okay, here. Yeah, see what you're doing now. You're stoking the fear that people are going to take away your guns. They're going to take away all your rights, all your liberty. Here we go. And it only gets better. What in the hot hell is wrong with you? What the hell is wrong with you people? It's not just about the guns. It's about your ability to worship. It's all tied together because if they can take your guns away, they can take your ability to worship God away. And they're trying to do everything in one swoop. And don't be deceived by all the rhetoric that you're hearing out there this morning. And I, that's not the, today's message, but I've just, I've been grieved in my spirit and I felt grieved last night, the very minutes after this took place, watching the comments of these senseless politicians, these brainless politicians, and these demon-possessed politicians that have been on their shows uh, blaming the president for this, blaming rhetoric, blaming everything else, blaming the guns. Uh, Biden was out there blaming the NRA yesterday. Uh, Beto O'Rourke blaming Trump for the rhetoric of white national supremacists, and he's embracing the same ideology this killer did in El Paso. And I want you to think about this, folks. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. Don't think about this. Don't think about this because apparently Chris is not thinking about this. So, <laughs> or really think about this and the fact that what, what, what the bloody hell is this? And yes, no one talk about our guns. Don't talk about them like that. There are second amendment. It's almost like the first amendment. Isn't it guns then God, right? Because if they take our guns away, they're not going to let us worship. We won't even be able to pray silently anymore because of the chemtrails in the skies and they'll be using their mind tricks against us and the witch. I don't even know any what I. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, yeah. Now, now you may say with the Christian crazy of the week that, that this should be it. This should be the apex. This should be the top of the list. No, no, no. These guys, these guys have, have their own built in audiences. Yes. Uh, these kooks and crackpots are kooks and crackpots, but let's talk about 
Let's talk about this Ohio lawmaker. Let's talk about Candace Keller. She represents a district not far from Dayton. So, she posted this. Just, just let some of this sink in, okay? So this is an elected official posting this. After every mass shooting, the liberals start the blame game. Why not place the blame where it belongs? The breakdown of their traditional American family. Parentheses, thank you, transgender, homosexual marriage, and drag queen advocates. Fatherlessness, subject no one discusses or believes is relevant. The ignoring of violent video games, the relaxing of laws against criminals and open borders, the acceptance of recreational marijuana, failed school policies, hello parents defending their mace-behaving students, disrespect to law enforcement, thank you, Obama, hatred of our veterans, thank you, professional athletes who hate our flag and the national anthem, the Dem Congress, many members of whom are openly anti-Semitic, the culture which totally ignores the importance of God and church until they elect a president. State office holders who have no, I don't even, who have no interest. I think, that she, first of all, like Candace's biggest sin here is punctuation. That the run on sentence that doesn't, yeah, yeah. This girl, this girl needs some issues. Uh, she needs some help with semicolons, by the way. But that's not the biggest problem here. Biggest problem here with elected official <laughs> in the state of Ohio, Candace Keller, who is blaming everything but the obvious thing, but the obvious thing that is sitting right in front of it. It is, it is, this is like whataboutism. Well, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? We're blaming everything. You know, basically the spirit of Colin Kaepernick kneeled and went into the shooters and made them, I don't, what are you even talking about? You were just striking out in a moronic, in a moronic, and I would also say for the way that she's talking about this, she belongs fairly well in the Christian crazy based upon the things that, she, we, that she's been taught to hate. <laughs> you can tell she's a good evangelical by the things that she hates. Can I get an amen for that, Sister Kella? No, no, no amens to that. No, this is sick. This is disgusting. And this is just playing the blame game because again, because again, what do we learn for Chris McDonald? Don't anyone go out blaming our beautiful guns. We've raised them. We've polished them. We have them in arsenals under our house just in case we need to fight back against the government someday as a malit. No, what? I don't. This, this is where it breaks down. This is where it breaks down. And this, this, this is a good place that leads us to what we're going to talk about today. Now, I said earlier, especially if you're just tuning in now, we're going to kind of be unpacking a portion, a portion, a portion. You heard me say this. Not all of this. I said earlier in the hour, we're going to be looking at a micro, a micro look on part of the problem that brings us to this place of gun shootings, violence, and the rise of white nationalism in America. Because they're all related. These are related. These are related. We have a bunch of... Yeah, okay. This, let, uh, let me start this. Let me start this with a story. To, to, to quasi-prove my point. No, 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 no. Not to prove my point. Um, it, it's, I'm not really trying to prove a point. I'm actually wanting to, to kind of invite you at least into my head for like the next little while. Um, and tell you a story about, about the ways that I, I feel like that we've seen kind of in the Christian crazy people blaming everything, using all these excuses. We've, we've heard people that will say it's mental illness, it's all of this other kind of stuff. One thing I, I will just, I will remind you, I'm not saying these people were completely mentally well, but guess what? We really can't even blame this on mental illness. Hate isn't a mental illness. Hate is not a mental illness. And also, for those of us that would say that we try to walk in the ways of Jesus, I feel like this should be one of the Beatitudes. Blessed, you know, in, in the church today in America, blessed, blessed be the, the guns, for they will make you see God. Yeah, sorry, that was dumb. That was snarky. Um, but you are listening to Snarky Faith. So I, I'm going to tell you just, that we're going more to contemplative. So we're going more this contemplative route instead of this excuse route, instead of a political route necessarily. But we will talk about those in the periphery. 
But let's just talk about this on a personal level. Like, how can we respond to things like this? What are, what are the small things that we can do every day that can have a bigger impact on these things? And these are the things that I think that we tend to overlook. We tend to overlook the simple things that we can be doing. And instead, we like to blame the larger things. Like, we can say we need gun control. Of course we need gun control. Of course we do. Um, and we can, we can rally, we can protest, we can elect in people that will hopefully enact gun control, and that is part of what we can do. But we don't do that every day of the week. So I'm going to tell you a little story about, about my family. Um, no, no, not my, my wider, broader, Christian crazy family, but my, my, my nuclear family, me and my, my uh, offspring, my spawns. Uh, so for those of you that do know my kids, uh, I'm going to tell a story about one of them. And uh, one of them right now is really, 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 really struggling with, with pride. And this person has a real hard time ever admitting that they are wrong or apologizing. Now, if you know my kids, it's not that one. It's not the one you're thinking. It is absolutely not the one you're thinking. And then after I say that, you may be thinking about a different one, and it's not that one either, okay? It's just not that one. Now, now, if you've come this far and you think of the third, yes, it's probably that one that you're thinking about now, okay? I'm kidding. I'm leaving this vague on purpose. Uh, so I'm not like parent shaming right now. But, but one of my, my offspring um, has, has this deep-seated issue lately when it comes to ever admitting that they are wrong. They will fight it. They, they will fight it tooth and nail. And, and even when it's been obvious they've been proven wrong, they still have a hard time admitting it. They make other excuses. They make other blame things. And, and, so, and so I've been having just lots of conversations with this individual that shares DNA with me. And, and what, I, what I've just been able to see is it's like this digging in of the heels. Even when they know what they're doing is wrong even when they know that they don't have a leg to stand on. They just don't want to cede the ground they are standing in. They do not want to admit fault. They do not want to admit that they are wrong. Because they somehow believe that it will make them a lesser person by admitting fault. Okay, tracking with me? Okay. And then... So I did this as any good parent does. As, as I'm watching through the news, um, there is a, I think it was on CNN. And you can just look at this. Uh, it, it's, it's, I, I, I found it again because after I watched this and showed it to my wife and we kind of laughed at this. this uh, okay, I'll explain. There's, um, you can find it by looking up, I think it was on CNN I had this and it was online. It was, you can look up like old lady tased. So just look up this old lady that gets pulled over because she has a broken taillight. And sorry if I spoiled it, she eventually gets tased. Um, so this, this older woman gets pulled over and the cop tells her, Hey, your taillights out. I'm going to give you a fine. And she's like, well, no one's pulled me over like in the last six months for it. Just give me a warning. And he's like, you've had this for six months and you haven't had it fixed. Yeah, I can get it fixed easily if I want to. And, uh, she will not sign her ticket. He's asking her, well, can you go ahead and sign this? She will not. Uh, she pushes it back to him, rolls up the window, locks her doors eventually drives off. The cop actually follows her for four minutes, as the video says, and you're seeing all this through his chest cam. And, and okay, this isn't one of the horribly bad uh, excessive police videos that, that we see out there. Um, and I know I shouldn't be laughing about this, and so then pulls her over again. Uh, she refuses to get out of the car. He opens the door, tries to pull her out. She starts kicking and fighting. There's rolling on the ground. There's eventually a tasing. And then, 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 okay. So I'm not, I'm not into like watching humans get hurt. Sometimes it is funny, but not usually. So when we're watching this, and then, so he eventually cuffs her and he's talking to her, and, and she's sitting in the back of the cop car still making excuses. Well, you shouldn't have tased me. Well, why didn't you sign this? Well, I didn't want to sign this. I didn't want to. It's stupid that it cost it. And so, and so she's still, like, she's still not ceding ground after she has been tased, after she's been pulled out of her car, after she's been charged with what will be a misdemeanor and potentially a felony too for resisting arrest and, and kicking officers and doing all this kind of stuff. And when I say, yes, so, so you're kind of seeing this. And, and, and after all this has happened, she is still making excuses for why her behavior is okay. So why am I talking about that? Why am I talking about that when it comes um, to, these, to these mass shootings? 
nowadays. And, and I wanted to kind of mention what, what we've begun to see, especially in the lead up uh, until these more recent shootings. We've been seeing in America the, uh, the proliferation of, of our president speaking in this hateful, racist rhetoric. He's, he's using all of these just kind of like racist, uh, like dog whistles. He, he's using all of these phrases over and over again. And what we end up seeing is people getting upset about this and calling him out on it and the other side supporting him and saying, oh, no, oh, no, you're just making too much of this. Everyone's using the race word. Oh, we're just using all this too easy. It's not this. But we see like these shooters we've had anything from Christchurch to to uh, I think it was the shooter in, in El Paso, like who had a manifesto online, too. And they quote Trump. And one of the, the sick things is, is that we have seen is that Trump did not create bigotry. Trump did not create, he embodies it well, but he didn't create white nationalism. But he's sure given it a platform. He is sure riled it up. And all at the same time, I don't think it's a mistake that you have evangelicals continuing to defend and support Trump and Trump speaking like a racist white nationalist and Christian people standing behind him and, 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 make, and defending him. Do you, do you kind of see that? that we're, we, have like, we have like the really far out people that write manifestos and shoot stuff uh, that support Trump and agree with what he's saying. And then we have the evangelicals who continue to support Trump and kind of give him a pass every time he's racist and hateful and bigoted, which is just like a Monday for him. And, and part of this, and, and I'm not going to speak to the overall issues because I'd even mentioned this earlier that I think that, that we're, we're labeling this uh, wrong when we blame video games. Oh, good Lord. We haven't used that one in a while. Okay, let's bring that one back in to, to explain these shootings. Uh, you know, we can say it's mental illness. Sure, but a lot of these people have not been diagnosed for this. And it's, that's, again, that's an easy way for us to, to push this off. But I think we have to speak to this, this idea of hate in, in America, this deep-seated fear and hate that drives people. And since you're listening to a show called Snarky Faith, I'm going to be speaking at this more, more towards um, that, that evangelical ilk that continues to defend and support a president that continues to rile up, to rile up these kind of um, individuals and where some people take him at his word and then go and shoot people. Now, I mentioned that because I feel like the church in America right now has a repentance problem. And, and I, 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 I want us to be able to kind of dig in on that a little bit. And the act of repentance, because I think, I think in many ways... When we, when we think of the words uh, repentance in the Bible, it's always like, repent, repent so you don't go to hell, boy. Repent. God is angry with you. You should feel guilty and repent. Go repent your sins. And, and we do this in, in kind of an abstract way where, where we have kind of theologically, especially like evangelical churches, have, have gotten really good at playing the guilt card. I also know we have many Catholic listeners here too. In the Catholic Church, hey, 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 they started the guilt card way before the evangelicals did. Sorry, I'll give you guys your props. But, but I feel like we, we've created this whole scenario where it's all about us being bad and being distant from God, right? Sin, sin gets in the way from God. God can't see us. God has sin blinders. He's like, where are you? I can't let you into heaven because I can't see you because of your sin. No. See, and I think that's I think that's actually I think that's actually a huge theological mistake that we make here. Now, if you want to go ahead and hit the heretic button and tune out right now, go for it. Go for it. But see, I think when we talk about things like sin, sin is like when we're screwing up, when we're doing things that aren't God honoring or neighbor honoring. 
meaning that our neighbors being everyone else that's not us around us. So we, when we are not, when we screw up in our relationship with God or when we screw up in our relationship towards others, I feel like that is more of a sin thing. And, it, and it's usually dealt, it's usually like on the lines of, of, of selfishness or anger or hatred. There's something that's there. And, and when I mention this, when I mention the, the, the idea of repentance and why the church in America needs to learn to repent um, and why they won't, I'll tell you that too. But I think that we've made repentance this like abstract thing. I think we've made it this thing that's really abstract. It's almost just like a mental exercise, right? So I have somehow sinned and offended God, offended God. So I need to just tell God I'm sorry. And we've made repentance this, this thing that's kind of easy because I can kind of do it quietly like, oh, I'm sorry. Um, but admitting our fault, admitting we were wrong, it's hard to do. Like, like for me to look at another human being, like my child that was refusing to do this, uh, to look at the other human being that had been wronged and admit fault is a powerful thing. Is a powerful thing. And one of the problems, and, and I think that this somehow fits into, it fits into this issue with, um, well, with, with nationalism, with white nationalism and Christian nationalism, which is the thing. Um, those, those kind of pursuits are, are, are more of like a strongman pursuit. I am good. I am proud. Look at me. Look at me. I am on the winning team. Right? I, I, you know, we have King Jesus in heaven. He's already won. We're on the winning team. We always win the Super Bowl every year. It doesn't ever get boring. Blah, blah, blah. We're so tired of winning. That kind of thing. But we, we, we think of this in an abstract, but we don't think of this in a, in a person-to-person manner because the, the action of admitting fault, the action of, 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 of repentance is, is, is an incredibly humble pursuit. It, it means, first of all, I, ha- I had to have recognized that what I did caused pain or hurt in someone else or it, or it, or it, it messed with my relationship with family member, a neighbor, a coworker, someone that we're dealing with, right? So I first have to have that, that thing where I take stock in myself and say, well, what, what did I do? And, 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 and when I'm admitting that, I'm also saying, how did I hurt someone else? And, and then you're realizing that, and then that's hard as it is. And I think a lot of people can't even do those two things. But then the third one, going to them and saying, I was wrong. I apologize for what happened and I may have hurt you and it was not what I wanted to do. And we, we, we repent and we ask for forgiveness. And that is an incredibly powerful act. And, and it isn't some sort of overly theological pursuit. It's a very human thing. It's a very human thing. It, it's saying, I want to mend what I have broken. I see the value in my relationship so much that my actions, selfish or whatever else, cause them has, has broken this connection I had to you, my neighbor. And I want to mend this. And I know, and in, in, in once we do that, we don't know how they will respond, but we have tried to make things right. The act of repentance is a thing that, that is at the core of Christianity. And, and I think too often we over- spiritualized repentance. We make it that like, oh, Jesus is coming down and he's healing us and he's taking our guilt away. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. No, no, it, it's, it's a difficult road to do that. It's not something I just pray away in church. It's me having to go and look at another human in their eyes and admit that I was wrong. It's me admitting that I was wrong but it's also admitting that I value this other person so much that I'm willing to swallow my pride. I'm willing to swallow that down because this connection, this relational, this relationship matters to me. And I think that we've come to a place in America nowadays where the church has become more about kind of... uh, pop psychiatry, pseudo spirituality. And it's about making us feel good. And it's about making us feel clean where we can go and get right with God, but it doesn't matter if we're right with our neighbor. 
see, the funny thing is those two things were absolutely interconnected. If I'm out doing these heinous things, I'm not connected to God. I'm not even connected to myself as a human anymore when I'm doing this. Like these ideas of self-reflection and empathy, are they, are they you know, evangelical church that continues to prop up Donald Trump? Do, do you see any of those in him? Do you see empathy? Do you see uh, humility? Do you see, do you see that? Any in, in, in infallibility in, in, in his words or speech? No, no, no. He continues to do what we continue to see the church do is double down. And they double down and they double down and they double down and they keep doubling down. And the more you double down in these situations, the harder you get and the more lying you have to do to those around you and to yourself. And I believe, and I know this, you know, there's so many other things we could be talking about, but I felt like this is a little bit more interesting to be talking about today when we talk about this. That one aspect of the problem that we have in America is the fact that we're not willing to say that we're sorry. We're not willing to repent. We're not willing to admit that we're wrong. I mean, we see this. We see this just in its most heinous and malignant as, as we watch it in, in politics unfold. Far be it from any side to ever admit fault or to ever admit they were wrong on an issue. No, we just double down and push on. And we have a president who just lies. Like, he lies more than he breathes. How does he handle it? He just doubles down. He keeps doubling down and keep pushing forward. He keeps just moving this down the field. And then we see this. We see these for, for, for these people that are starved of community on, like, 8chan, which is, like, the message board that, that uh, the, the El Paso shooter had posted his manifesto on. It was just, like, this breeding ground of hate. But we see these people that are unhappy with the world, and their answer is to double down, double down, double down. We're, like, they're not asking themselves, well, uh, if I'm an incel, why can't I get a date? Oh, it's women's fault. No, no, no. It's because you're a horrible person and you're a douche. Uh, why, why uh, if I'm a Christian, why, why do my neighbors not want to hear me talk about Jesus? Uh, because you're judging them. You're being a horrible person to them and they don't see the love of Christ at all in you. You see, we've learned to stick to our guns so much that we will never admit fault in what we're doing. It feels like social media suicide to ever admit you're wrong when you're in an argument, right? You've got to get in that last zinger. You've got to really roast them. You've got to do something to make sure that you feel good about where you stand and that you never admit that you're wrong. And the problem is, the American church has forgotten how to do this. The church doesn't want to admit where they have sinned in real ways. Sure, I've seen, I've seen denominations come out and say, we apologize for backing slavery 200 years ago. Things that have no teeth. Fine, if you're apologizing for that, how are you dealing with the minority community today? Oh, you're not doing anything? Oh, well, I'm sure the people that lived 100 years ago are really happy you finally made the statement now. You know, the ones that are dead? No, no, no. And, and instead of us responding to these tragedies by scapegoating, I think we have to continuously return to look at ourselves. Because we've gotten in this situation where we are in America, we were polarized, we cannot hear each other, where we just hate the other, we disagree, and we just disown people who don't believe like us. We don't see our role in all of this. Again, remember I told you, we're going from a micro perspective, not a macro one. I'm not looking for gun control conversations right now because I want a different take on this. And I want something. I want something that we can do. And, and in response to these situations, in response to this, this, this outcry and outrage and the things that we want to be able to call our senators and, and call our congressmen and demand for all this, and those are all good. We want to go protest. Those are all good. Do that. Do that. Do that. Keep being an advocate. Keep going out and protesting. Keep doing that. I'm not saying to stop that. But I am saying, I am saying, 
us beginning to ask those questions. You know, instead of us saying this person was sick and horrible and nasty, how do I dehumanize those around me? Right? I mean, people that write manifestos are really great at dehumanizing people. They're really great at scapegoating people. They're really great at blaming people. Uh, but people that have manifestos haven't really done a whole lot of soul searching usually. Uh, people that shoot people up, I'm pretty much telling you they're not really in touch with contemplation and how their actions affect others and how they're, they're projecting their hate onto others, thinking that it's going to somehow fix the situation. So as we go out to protest, as we go out to post things on social media about our outrage and how our hearts are broken and about how all of this is so, so, so messed up, and it is, and, and our outrage should lead us towards action. I, I just, I believe, I believe that we need to also let this be a time for introspection. I may not have a gun and I may not go out and kill people, but there are small ways that I may be dehumanizing people and saying I am more important than you are by my actions. For someone to go into an area with a gun and take someone else's life, take someone else's son or daughter or husband or wife or child or grandparent away from them, it says that person is more important than whoever they are shooting. They've elevated their status. And so if we want to be outraged, we have to be outraged at ourselves. We have to be outraged at the micro ways that we do the same thing in smaller bits. And it's easy for us to say, well, I'm not that crazy. I'm not that hateful. I'm not that bigoted. No, no, no. I feel like for us to really embrace Christ, for us to embrace the words of Christ, we have to embrace, and I feel like I say this every single week here, we have to embrace the ways, the means, the mold, the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus was practicing, he practiced humility. He practiced humility. He practiced introspection. He practiced all of this. And his way and mold of doing this was he had a posture of being a servant as he walked out into the world. And so when we see someone else and, and we want to act out in, in microviolence, maybe it's getting mad and just swearing at them when I'm in my car or honking my horn or, or treating somebody uh, in the checkout line that uh, treating them like they're stupid or less than me because they're not moving fast enough because I have been inconvenienced at their slowness in offering me service. You know, where have I neglected to know my neighbor? Where have I neglected helping those around us? See, when I put my priorities and all that I have above everybody else, I, I'm, I'm inciting acts of violence. And, and I'm a firm believer that lots, of, <laughs> lots and lots of microviolence leads to macroviolence. And in many ways, if we were more connected with each other, like that, this is how we, we get systemic change. Sure, let's enact gun laws. Absolutely, let's go for it. Let's protest. Absolutely. Let's call out racist uh, talk. Let's call out the president whenever we can. Absolutely. But I want the, also, let's throw the and in there. Let's throw the and in there. If we're going to protest, if we're going to be outraged, let's also just try to make sure, let's try to make sure that we're not doing the thing that we hate that we are not doing the things that we hate. And I'm even going to throw in a little bit here. I'm even going to throw in a little bit of scripture here. we get a little Sunday school here. Uh, in Romans 2.5, where Paul says that because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself. You are storing up wrath against yourself. And it feels like, it feels like all we're seeing is people storing up wrath against others. But if people have wrath against others, I also feel like it's because they have wrath against themselves and they're not dealing with it. And they're just pouring it out upon other people. And I, for one, don't want to be stubborn and unrepentant. And I, for one, man, my back isn't good enough to be able to store up and hold enough wrath on a regular basis. So I would rather not do that. I would rather not do that. And for the last bit, I want to throw out a little bit of psychology here for this. So this is an article from Psychology Today um, entitled, Why is it so hard for some people to admit that they were wrong? And 
the question, why do these people never admit why they're wrong? I'll just say this from their article directly here. The answer is related to their ego, their very sense of self. Some people have such fragile ego, such a brittle self-esteem, such a weak psychological constitution that admitting they made a mistake or that they were wrong is fundamentally too threatening to their egos to tolerate. Accepting they were wrong, absorbing that reality would be so psychologically shattering, their defense mechanisms do something remarkably remarkable to avoid uh, doing so. They literally distort their perception of reality to make it, which is reality, less threatening. Their defense mechanisms protect their fragile ego by changing the very facts in their mind so they are no longer wrong or culpable. Does that sound like any president? Does that sound like any group of pastors you've ever been around? Anyone? Any priests you've ever been around? (laughs) Oh, ego? Ego in the church? What? Ego in the clergy? Huh? Yeah, the clergy is fueled by ego. That's what they eat for breakfast. Yeah. Yeah. And the article goes on to say this. The people who exhibit this kind of behavior are, by definition, uh, psychologically fragile. However, that assessment is often difficult for people to accept because to the outside world, they look like as if they're confidently standing on their ground, standing their ground, not backing down, things we associate with strength. But uh, psychological rigidity is not a sign of strength. It's an indication of weakness. These people are not choosing to stand their ground. They're compelled to. They're compelled to do so to protect their fragile egos. Admitting we are wrong is unpleasant. It is bruising for any ego. And it takes a certain amount of emotional strength and courage to deal with that reality and to own up our mistakes. Most of us sulk when we have to admit we're wrong, but we will get over it. Psychology tells us, Jesus tells us to do the same thing. What? Same thing? That's weird. I know. It's weird when Jesus makes sense to like, you know, common humanity. Yeah, yeah. Because you know when Jesus talks about in order to be strong, we must be willing to be weak? This is one of those. If we want to be strong, if we want to change the world, if we want to make the world a better place, hell, I don't even care, because I know I have I've atheist listeners out there too. I love all of you guys. You don't have to even believe in God for this. But for us, for us to be strong is for us to know where our limitations are, or for us to know what we're capable of doing in the positive and the negative, and for us to own our crap. I would have said something else, but I really don't want to edit this last bit on my show to throw in the censor. We really, ah, screw it. We really need to learn to own our shit. Did you hear me? Own your own shit. That should be in the Bible. Actually, it is. I mean, you'd probably only hear it this way in the uh, snarky narky uh, paraphrased version of the Bible, but essentially, yeah, yeah. Here's, here's what I would essentially say most of what Jesus' teachings are is, one, don't be a dick. Two, own your own shit. And three, be nice to other people because that's what God tells us to do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That'll preach. Not in many churches, though. <laughs> I mean, I'd love if that church existed. It just doesn't. So I wanted to end our hour with this. Um, and this is like a portion of liturgy that I found um, from Aaron Nequist. And, and I thought it kind of like, it speaks a little bit to, to what I'm talking about today. And I think he had originally written this as more of an Ash Wednesday contemplation. But he starts off like quoting from like Luke 18 here by saying this, for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. And the liturgy begins like this. Can we just admit together we're not fine? Because I'm not fine and you're not fine. Can we admit together we're afraid? Because I'm afraid and you're afraid. Can we just admit together we have doubts? Because I have doubts and you have doubts. Can we just admit together we're not free? Because I'm not free and I want to be. And if you're not free, sing, sing with me. Emmanuel, God who is with us, we humbly call your name, Emmanuel, as near as our need, as close as the air as we breathe. Emmanuel, Lord, have mercy. And as we end this broadcast, 
Just a reminder that you can catch us on podcast at www.snarkyfaith.com. You can also find us pretty much anywhere you put out podcasts. Um, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Hey, and guess what? I love to chat with you guys, my listeners. So feel free to shoot me questions, questions at snarkyfaith.com or stalk me online. I'm really not hard to find. And I will leave you with this as we stand in the place where there has been tragedy and we don't really know what to do. We just continue to say, Lord, have mercy on us. So may you walk into this week and may you own, may you own your own shit. And as you walk into this week, may you walk with the holiest amount of grace and snark and peace. I'm out of here. Catch you guys next time. WCOM is listener-supported community radio, and Snarky Faith is only possible through our sponsors. Lumen, a spiritual community of seekers, sojourners, question askers, doubters, and skeptics, is a collective of fellow travelers that embrace the truth that all of life is sacred, hope is real, and tomorrow can be a better day than today. All are welcome. You can find more information at www.lumencommunities.com.